Next on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show, here's Ryan O'Neill. He looks so happy to be here, Alfred University political science professor emeritus. Dr. Bob's got a big smile on his face. Why is that? It's always a joy, Brian. It's always a joy to get together with you and, <laughs> and the audience out there. Yes, yes. Um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she's moving uh, forward with impeachment. But the Hill.com, which is pretty neutral, pointed out Pelosi did not say on what charges. What's that mean to you that no charges are mentioned? Well, I think uh, on uh, Wednesday... Uh, we got this uh, idea that somehow, or maybe it was yesterday, that uh, Pelosi had met with her caucus and uh, there was a rave, uh, roaring support for her. And uh, she came out and uh, said, you know, we're going ahead with impeachment. That all sounds a little too pat to me, frankly. First of all, uh, the caucus was uh, secret. There, nobody, no outsiders were allowed into it. So all we are getting is uh, how uh, people inside the caucus are characterizing it. And I'm, there are some people there, obviously, that are highly biased in favor of impeachment. Um, so it would make sense, I guess, uh, for the impeachers uh, to present this as a united front on the part of the Democrats and they're enthusiastically moving forward. There's just too many... Uh, people uh, suggesting otherwise um, to uh, take that with full credit, I think. Um, the, um, I think, uh, as you know, Representative Reed has already suggested that uh, this, this is not going, they're not going to be able to get an impeachment vote out of the House. And a number of other people have suggested that uh, there's a number of Democrats who are really very, very uh, uncomfortable uh, forcing an impeachment vote uh, when they've uh, won districts that uh, carried uh, heavily for Trump. So uh, we'll just have to see how this works its way out. Um, I think uh, one of the questions, well, first of all, uh, we have the question of what, you know, what impeachment articles are we dealing with here? What kind of statements are they making? <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, then um, you have the question of whether once these uh, articles get on the floor of the House, would it be possible to amend them? Or is Pelosi going to put strict rules in place preventing anybody from suggesting an amendment? And uh, uh, if, if she does that, why then... Uh, I think she feels that she has enough votes there to get them through. But whether it'll be an overwhelming Democrat vote, I don't know. On the other hand, if they're able to amend them and, uh, and put in there instead of uh, impeachment, uh, censure or some other kind of uh, uh, sanction, um, then I think it does open it up uh, pretty widely for um, cross-the-board uh, support. Um, so we'll just have to see how the rules play out on the floor of the House and uh, uh, whether uh, some of these Democrats, I mean, I think if they, if they push those through and, and vote them and uh, they get uh, uh, almost complete Democrat support, I think there's a pretty good chance the Republicans are going to gain pretty heavily into 2020. Because of the impeachment. Yeah. It just you just kind of wonder you kind of shake your head at just what are the just what are they doing here now on uh, Wednesday I watched uh, some of these uh, uh, constitutional scholars um, appear before the uh, judiciary committee and boy that was that was really that was really quite interesting now you're a professor what did you think of those professors well I've taught a lot of constitutional law in my day and uh, these uh, the schools that they came from are fine schools, obviously Stanford and Harvard, and North Carolina, and uh, I it's Turley is it's Turley right uh, was from right is he from G W or Georgetown I'm thinking maybe one of the two, At any rate uh, fine schools but you just kind of you just kind of shake your head uh, what what are these guys what are these guys teaching anyway I mean they're so clearly biased. 
But uh, the point we made before they even showed up was you have to distinguish between what kind of actions actually occurred, and then a question is what is the constitutional status of high crimes and misdemeanors and some of these other terms in the Constitution. And it was pretty clear that a number of these um, so-called uh, nonpartisan scholars uh, assumed that the strongest charges being made were true when, of course, there's really no basis for most of these charges at all. Can I jump in, Doc? And uh, so, yes, go ahead, jump. Conservatives say the pres- the professors, none of them know President Trump. Why are they there? Liberals say nothing about this. You go to liberal media websites, Daily Beast, all these websites, they say nothing about the judges that showed up except for the fact that Tucker Carlson called uh, one of the professors, uh, Pam Carlin, a moron. That's the story. Yeah. No, well, nothing about certainly... the professor's testimony or... Yeah. In her performance uh, before the judiciary, I mean that was that was really strange. Um, so, but in the other side of this, uh, Brian, you have to think of these guys in their um, in law school and and their resumes and such, and having a line on their resume that they in fact participated in uh, the historic impeachment effort of uh, President Trump. I mean, uh, I guess that adds their scholarly credentials, although certainly what they had to say, it seems to me, did not add much at all. Now, Turley's points, and he appears on uh, BBC every once in a while as a um, commentator as well. I mean, that's the point we've been making all along here. Uh, I don't know if certainly listens to this program, but the <laughs> point we uh, have been making has been that uh, you're setting a precedent here that is going to bite uh, a, lot, a Democrat presidents as well as later presidents to set the tre- tre- pardon me to set the threshold so low on uh, made up uh, testimony and as uh, Turley said basically sh- a slipshod approach toward this uh, whole approach um, is really weakening the country and weakening the Constitution and is uh, really uh, a very poor way to proceed. Now, it's not that he is a big Trump supporter, because he's not. In fact, I guess he voted for uh, Clinton. But the point is, this is uh, really half-baked, and it's an emotional uh, response. uh, And uh, so uh, and I think he laid it out pretty well. Um, It's pretty hard to argue with what he had to say. So I would hope that uh, that will have some effect on some of these people and they'll come to their senses and slow things down. But at any rate, uh, it, was, it was kind of fascinating, yeah. Uh, one thing that uh, Fox News Radio's uh, Brian Kilmeade said on uh, his show uh, on Thursday morning was that he found Nancy Pelosi wearing her Catholicism on her sleeve very tiresome and very transparently fake, he said, uh, constantly talking about praying for President Trump when really what she wants is the impeachment. And she's just being pushed into this by, and in some ways she's being pushed into this by the squad. But this whole, I'm praying for him and I'm Catholic and you can't say, you know, get off that. Is that what she said? She was yeah. Catholic and she was... Uh, she was praying for him. That's weird. She plays that religion card a lot out there. I wasn't and... aware of that. No, I think it's absolutely true. Uh, she's, she, uh, I think, does not like President Trump much at all. And uh, she wants to... But uh, the other side of it is she has to try to hold together some of these wild-eyed uh, leftists she's got running around there in the house. So she's uh, desperately trying to hold on to her position and um yeah she's so she's really straddling the fence there and um maybe maybe she does need a little prayer there I don't know. <laughs> on yes. tuesday uh the uh, committee released a report on the impeachment inquiry judiciary committee uh which included records uh of phone calls well, hold from on now is this a Devin, judici- yeah not the uh 
in, in, in uh, intelligence committee. Then this is okay. It was Schiff that grabbed the. Phone okay, call. correct me there. Yeah. Right. Right. But anyways, the, the uh, it, it comes out that Schiff subpoenaed the phone companies, AT and T and others, to get uh, the phone records of. Uh, Presidential lawyers, Rudy Giuliani, and uh, Schiff is denying some of this. Uh, says, you know, he just went after uh, Giuliani's phone records and not the others. But uh, the, this has a lot of people upset on the conservative side. I haven't heard the libertarians yet, but I bet Rand Paul's going to say something. Yeah. Now, uh, to go out and start uh, um, combing through all your phone calls and such. I don't know. It seemed to me you'd need uh, some basis for being able to do that. There's a, but at any rate, uh, it's not something I'm terribly familiar with. So, well, I wanted to ask you about that. You having uh, some experience there with, I believe, the American Civil Liberties Union a long time ago. Yes, many years ago. Yes. Uh, is Schiff stepping into some stuff here? Well, no. I think he's doing a number of things that the Civil Liberties Union is going to have real problems with. Yes. Uh, in that respect, not that there are too many people who belong to the American Civil Liberties Union who are big supporters of Trump, but they're, you know, they're pretty n notorious for defending your rights whether they like you or not. And uh, I, I think they'll have some serious uh, questions about some of that. Uh, so it's the Wall Street Journal, no big friend of Trump. Their editorial board came out against Congressman Adam Schiff for looking into phone records and publishing them in this report. It's, the, the the records showed who was on the call, the date, the time, how long they were on the call. This is uh, sort of the slipshod uh, extra-constitutional approach here that uh, I think Turley's pretty pretty unhappy about, and we should be too. So we got some other things to talk about here. Can we, before we leave, what this, whole, this, this whole impeachment thing has been about phone calls, ratting people out well, on what you true. heard on a phone call, releasing transcripts of phone calls. I mean, I know they don't want Trump there, but aren't we stepping on some rights to get rid of somebody and the end justifies the means here? Well, I think that's probably true. But again, I don't have that much information. But it is true This uh, everything started started, I guess, with this phone call that President Trump made, which he's released uh, the transcript and everything from. So that's not private at all. Uh, but, uh, no, this is, uh, yeah. Really, I think uh, the country as a whole, first of all, is tired of this whole thing. And second of all, if you explain to them what happened, they're going to shake their heads and say, you know, what's going on here? What, what are you guys thinking? So yeah. we'll just let the Democrats continue on their... Uh, uh, merry way here. Hollering and screaming about people's rights being taken away as they step on people's rights. Oh. Um, the Democrats campaign for the White House. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, a few developments there uh, this week. And uh, the big one, of course, is Kamala, Kamala Harris withdrawing from the race. And... Uh, uh, Really, um, a poor um, campaign effort on her part across the board as far as then. She started out fairly strong. I mean, here you have a, a African-American woman from California. That should be worth 10, 15 points in the polls right off the bat, I would think. But uh, I don't think she ever got much. She might have got up to 5 or 6% there at one point. But she clearly was uh, fading fast, uh, and uh, I just uh, I, you got to put that I, I suppose on her. I mean, it's her effort, but also I don't know who was advising her and uh, who was trying to run her campaign because uh, it was a pretty miserable uh, effort, and um, so. Uh, and and one of the problems was, of course, she didn't seem to stand for anything in particular. And um, I think it hurt her a lot. Now, what happens as a result of her stepping down? Uh, we'll just have to see how that plays. As I was listening to someone the other night that said, well, where's her support going to go? Well, uh, the guy pointed out she only had 2 or 3% in the polls anyway, so it's not going to make that much difference. But it does make a difference in the sense that when they got 
the debate going now. Everybody's concerned that I believe the debate in Los Angeles uh, is going to be, uh, what, uh, 10 or 12 white men, something like that. And uh, so now all the minority groups are saying, you know, well, where's the where's the uh, minority women, uh, African Americans? Uh, I don't know if they even have any Hispanics in there. They might have one there yet. Is it Cory Booker still left off? I don't think he's in there yet. He hasn't got the poll numbers or the. Oh, he won't be there. He's still there, but he's not in the debate yet. Yeah, no, he's still in the in the race. Uh, but uh, the rainbow, uh, you know. When the sun comes out and the rain stops, Brian, then the rainbows sort of fade away. And I think that's what's happening here. Uh, and uh, some of these minority groups getting pretty unhappy. And um, so in, in, in Trump's sense, uh, Trump can, can continue to parade the, the lowest uh, black and Hispanic, well, uh, Hispanic unemployment rates in history. Uh, and uh, then you take a look at the uh, Democrat line up there, and there's no blacks at all on the stage. Uh, that doesn't hurt Trump at all. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot of uh, scurrying about here. Uh, and uh, uh, increasingly, Brian, increasingly you can see that Hillary is edging up uh, toward uh, – throwing her uh, name in the ring here. Uh, and I think she'll be claim that, you know, there's just too much demand for her. They wanted her. She was needed. And um, Does Epstein I, stuff with Bill Clinton photos uh, posing with different people, does that hurt Hillary? Oh, I think so. Yeah, no, I think, I think she jumps in the race, and she might actually win the nomination. Uh, but a lot of people are going to say, oh, my God, go away. Does the Epstein thing hurt Hillary's chances? Epstein the Epstein photo? thing won't go away. And it's uh, there's a book out now, I guess, on the uh, whole Epstein thing and naming names and giving more information. I haven't, I haven't read it, haven't seen too much from it. I think it's just been out in the last few days. But there is uh, increasing information out there in terms of uh, plain manifests, and uh, one of the fellows uh, handling security or surveillance at uh, his ranch in New Mexico says that the Clintons were out there, I think, 20, 24 times, something like that. And Clinton, of course, said, yeah, well, he stayed at his place in New York City uh, three or four times. But apparently that's just not true. Uh, apparently he and Hillary were at uh, Epstein's ranch uh, numerous times. And, well, I don't know how far you can push this. Um, I've always kind of held back on the Bill and Hillary criticisms, but uh, other pe- you know, I'm just saying what other people are saying. Uh, I I don't think there's a lot of good feeling. No, no, but uh, um, the uh, this uh, what's her name, Giseline Maxwell, the uh, procurer for Mr. Epstein. Again, we still don't have. Uh, any information on whether the FBI has been able to contact her or whether she's talking to the FBI or not, because that would be, I think, really the, the clinching piece here, this whole effort, if she turned state's evidence. Uh, man, oh man, I don't know why she won, frankly, uh, because, um, as we know, Mr. Epstein died under rather strange circumstances, and she certainly knows as much or more than he did uh, if I were she, I would certainly uh, be uh, making sure that uh, I uh, yeah, I was covered. Uh, Trump and the uh, uh, Trump and the NATO visit. If Trump and the NATO visit. Yes, that uh, that's uh, kind of interesting too. Um, obviously, uh, he, he's got uh, he has a number of these uh, European leaders uh, kind of miffed, and Mr. Macron from uh, France, and he went at it. Uh, Head to head, which I thought was kind of, frankly, refreshing, um, and uh, I think Macron's got a lot of problems in France, but he made some comments about NATO, what that it was uh, dead in the head or something of the sort. Uh, Trump wasn't about ready to put up with that. Trump came to the defense of NATO. Yes, well, the United States has been giving a lot of support to NATO, 
And, uh, you know, Trump may make all kinds of comments about the countries that better be paying up, pay their share or whatever. And, in fact, a lot of them have gotten their uh, share of NATO pumped up now to a reasonable, to whatever the percentage is that they're supposed to contribute. So Trump is making some progress there. Plus, we have American troops uh, in uh, Poland, and I think we have American troops in some of the Baltic countries there, which are, of course, uh, continually threatened by the uh, Russians. Uh, we have we have troops there, as, as does NATO. And uh, so uh, the U.S. has been uh, really uh, pretty supportive of NATO here in their uh, attempts to uh, let the Russians know they're not going to put up with any hanky-panky there. And, in fact, uh, the uh, the uh, leader of NATO now, I think he may be a German, but I may be wrong on that, uh, is not criticizing Trump at all because, in fact, I think we've been given, we've been helping out, whereas Macron and some of these other uh, countries uh, – I don't think are all that helpful, and uh, the uh, the French in the United States uh, very often have been at odds on uh, uh, foreign policy. Uh, yeah, here and there, the French have supported us, but there have been situations where they haven't supported us at all. So uh, I uh, I think Mr. Macron is trying uh, to uh, strengthen his position there in France. And to watch the these leaders uh, sitting there and chuckling about Trump, apparently the Biden campaign is playing some of this as um, ads about uh, you know how bad Trump is. They're uh, laughing at him, kind of. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think uh, when you uh, get out into the real uh, world of America, um, people are going to say, yeah, well, who cares what. Who cares what so and so thinks over yeah, someplace yeah. else? No, yeah, absolutely. Well, Doc, uh, with that, uh, well, actually, there was one other thing. Yes, yes. Uh, Pelosi and Biden both lost their tempers this week. Joe Biden with a heckler talking about uh, his son Hunter Biden. Nancy Pelosi with a Fox reporter who asked, "Do you hate President Trump?" What do these temper tantrums say to you about uh, those two individuals or the climate in Washington? Well, I think it's very tense for them. And uh, I think uh, that's that's uh, a sign that uh, these guys are under a heck of a lot of stress. Um, now, one of the um, uh, theories I saw was that Hillary will wait till Biden drops out before she moves into the uh, arena. Um, I don't know if Biden will be all that quick to uh, drop out. He's uh, he's still polling well among the African American vote. And uh, although I think he is losing, I believe he's losing in Iowa and New Hampshire right now. So uh, Iowa's where he lost his fuse. Yeah, well, uh, he's yeah, right. He's going on the back roads and trying to get the rural uh, folks uh, piling in behind him. Um, so uh, I don't know. He uh, he may go the Kamala Harris route here and uh, pull out. And there's some uh, bits of. Uh, uh, talks he's given and such uh, where he's just strange. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he just says things that are just weird. Yeah. Uh, so we'll just see. It would be great to have a Biden-Trump uh, presidential race. I mean, talk about strange. strange. Yeah, Trump would, would lift all the, yeah. Trump would lift all those That's not that Trump quotes. doesn't say some pretty strange things, too. So, yeah. I mean, it would be wild. Oh, well, let's leave it with that, Brian. And join with House Speaker Pelosi praying for President Trump. Oh, we'll do what we can. 